there. To take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 10. Luke, chapter number 10, the title of the message this morning is The Christian's Message. The Christian's Message. This is a message that Jesus gave, not for the unsaved, but for the saved. If you happen to be here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, all oh, nothing could thrill my heart more than for you to come to trust Him today. But this message won't be directed to you. It'll be directed to those that are saved. Well, let's read, beginning at verse number 29. We'll read a few verses, stop, make some comments, and then we'll read a little bit further. Verse number 25, Luke 10, 25. I'm sorry, I think I said 29, but Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself saith unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? We'll stop there. We'll come back and read in just a moment. Would you notice a lawyer comes up to Jesus and ask him a question. It's a good question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice also, verse number 26, Jesus really doesn't answer the question, at least not directly. He does what he often did. He answers the question with a question. The question is, well, what do you think? That's essentially what Jesus tells him. What do you think? And then he listens to his answer. Verse number 27, this lawyer gives a great answer. As a matter of fact, the answer he gives here in Luke 10, 27 is the answer that Jesus gave to a different lawyer. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 22, along about verse number 36, another lawyer came and asked Jesus, what's the greatest command in the Bible? And this was the exact answer that Jesus gave him. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So he asked a question. Jesus lets him answer the question. And then Jesus tells him in verse number 28, that was answered right. You nailed that one. Uh, he even exonerates it a little bit more. He says, if you'll do this, you'll live. And he's talking about live for eternity. So uh, the man comes, he asks a question, how can I be saved? And, and the answer is love God with everything you've got. Love others as well. You'll make it to heaven is what Jesus pretty well tells him. If you really do those things. I want you to notice when Jesus complimented him, he did not in any way say anything to convict him. Everything he said was praiseworthy towards him. But for some reason, look at the question that the man felt like he needed to ask the latter part of verse number 29. And who is my neighbor? It's almost like whatever Jesus had said convicted him, but Jesus really didn't say anything to convict him. Uh, the man gave the answer. Jesus said, you got it right. But even as the words apparently were falling out of this man's mouth, Love God with all of your heart and love others as you love yourself. Even as he spoke the words, it was his answer. His own words apparently convicted him. Uh, he felt like he needed to narrow down the list of who his neighbors was. He knew he hadn't treated everybody like he wanted to be treated, like he preferred to be treated. And so he wanted to unneighbor some folks. Uh, he wanted to say, these that I have mistreated surely aren't my neighbors. You can see that by what the Bible says in verse number 29. He asked the question because he needed to justify himself. But now Jesus is going to answer that question, not directly, but with a parable. Pick up verse number 30 and notice the parable that Jesus gives to help this man find the answer. Verse 30, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him down to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. 
And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he, the lawyer, said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. The answer is not clearly stated, but it's given in parable form. Let's see if we can understand what message Jesus wanted to make sure we Christians knew. Try to look at it with three different thoughts. Number one, would you notice the groups of people in the parable? There's three groups of people mentioned in this parable. Let's spend just a few moments and see if we can figure out who these groups are. Number one, there was the victim. There was the innocent man that was the victim. He's the one who needed the help. We really aren't told very much about him. Uh, the only truths we know about him was what road he was on. He was on the road going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And what happened to him? He was attacked by thieves, and it would appear as though he was left virtually for dead. Uh, they left him apparently unconscious in the road, thinking that perhaps he would die there in the road. And that's really all we know about this man. It's amazing how much we don't know. Here's a parable. Jesus is trying to teach us who our neighbor is, but he leaves out all the important information. We don't know what nationality he was. We don't know what race he was. We don't know what religion he was. We don't know what political views he took. We don't know what sect of religious groups that he might have belonged to if he was a Jew. We really don't know anything about this man at all. And I'm wondering, why did God give us a parable about helping our neighbor? And then the one who is obviously the one who needs the help, the one who is supposed to be the neighbor, he gives us no information about him at all. He's just an anonymous man. I think it's so that you and I, Christians, might understand that all the anonymous people in the world are actually our neighbors. We see them all the time. We see them when they're on the side of the road with their thumb up in the air. We, we see them uh, sometimes when we're driving through an intersection or maybe in a big parking lot and we see them with their sign up that says homeless. Or, or maybe we see them uh, as they're taking their little cart and they're rolling it up a hillside behind a, a shopping mall someplace with what few belongings that they have as they're scooting it up and out of sight. These are the anonymous people that we don't have any idea who in the world they are, but these are the kind of people that are actually our neighbors. It's interesting. We probably think we know about them. We look at somebody and we say, you're homeless because you won't go out and get a job. We think we know them. Uh, uh, you don't have any food because you're a drug addict. If you just straighten up your life and, and quit shooting that dope, you'd be all right. We think, no, you don't have any place to lay your head because you walked away from your family. You've abandoned them. We think we know them, but in honest truth, we don't know anything more about these people than we know about this man. The only thing that we know about them is they need our help. They need our help. Notice the first group of people in the story is the one that we know absolutely nothing about, but he is the neighbor. He's the one that Jesus is given the story about so that we would know the answer to the question, so who is my neighbor? Number one, there was the person who needed the help. Number two, there's the religious people. There's a couple of religious people in this story. We meet them in verse 31 and 30 number, uh, verse number 31 and 32. Uh, first one's the priest. Second one is the Levite. These aren't just religious people. These are the highest standing religious people in the Jewish religion. The priest was the one who offered the sacrifices. The Levite was the one who took care of the property of God. Anything that God possessed the Levites took care of it. So these two offices, these two officers represented to the Jews the best that their religion has. Question, when you think about what religious people do, what kind of comes to your mind? What kind of people should religious people be? Well, I'll answer that because most people would put me in the category of being a religious person. What should a religious person be like? Well, I kind of get the idea he ought to love God. And he ought to love others. I'm kind of getting that from that greatest commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 36. From that, from that verse that even the lawyer said, uh, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Well, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love others 
as yourself. So a religious person ought to be somebody you would think that loves God and loves others. But then we go back to what the parable says about these two premium religious people, and it would appear as though neither one of those things was very high on their list of things to do. People ask the question, well, reckon why? These two religious people walking by saw this man beaten, bruised, broken, and laying naked in the road, and both of them walk by on the other side, and they try to come up with reasons, some, some explanation that might would justify what they did. I, I, I've read somewhere where somebody said, well, they were going to Jerusalem, and they didn't want to defile themselves. Priest, Levite, that's where they do their duties. You handle the sacrifices at the temple. Most of the possessions of God that the Levites would be taken care of would be at the temple. So they're saying, well, they're going to Jerusalem, and they didn't want to defile themselves, but that... That excuse won't fly for several reasons. It won't fly, number one, because to help somebody that's sick would not defile you. Granted, if it was a priest or a Levite and they touched a dead body, that would defile them. But the guy's not dead yet. <laughs> I hope these religious people aren't thinking, hey, I don't need to take a chance. I'd rather let him die then help him before he dies. But you kind of have to scratch your head in this parable and wonder just how bad can religious people be? I mean, they're actually walking on the other side of the road. No, uh, even, even if somehow they were to have defiled themselves, all they had to do is offer a sacrifice and they'd been clean again at sunset. So that there's really no problem here with them potentially defiling themselves. And, and then on top of that, they're not coming to Jerusalem. They're going from Jerusalem. You say, preacher, how do you know which direction they were going? Because verse number 30 tells us that they were coming down, down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You see, Jerusalem's up on the hill. It's the high spot. So anytime you leave Jerusalem, you're always going down. If you're going to Jerusalem, you're always going up. Bible says of both of these folks in verse 31 and again in verse number 32, they were going down, which means they weren't going to Jerusalem to do their religious service. More than likely, they had already been to Jerusalem and done their religious service, which tells me they ought not be worried about defiling themselves. They ought to have a little bit of revival somewhere inside their soul. There ought to be something inside them that ought to be saying, hey, I've worshiped God. Now let me serve God. But the truth of the matter is, both of these folks went around on the far side of the road. You say, well, preacher, how come, how come you think, how come you think these two wouldn't help this poor victim on the side of the road? The Bible doesn't tell us, so we can't know for sure. But what I think is they couldn't tell what nationality he was. They couldn't tell because verse number 30 tells us that he had been stripped of his clothing. Now, you might Say, so how do you connect those two dots, preacher? Well, uh, there's lots of ways you can tell in a diverse group what nationality a person is. In a diverse group, we're all pretty much the same culture. Be kind of hard to tell maybe where your roots are, but in a diverse group where you've got multiple nations overlapping, sometimes their skin color's different. In this particular case, it would not have been. The Jews, with all their neighbors around them, would have had similar colorings of skin. Sometimes the way they wear their hair or their beards is different. But most all the folks over in that Arabic world have beards and have same hairstyle. Probably wouldn't be able to tell by their hair. Probably wouldn't be able to tell, tell by their skin. But you could tell by their clothing. In the Old Testament, both the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, the Jews were required to wear certain things. They had to wear tassels at the bottom of their robes, at least four tassels on each of the four corners. So you can always tell a Jew just by looking at the hem of his garment. Not only so, but you could always tell a Jew because he could never mix the materials of his garment. He couldn't have polyester and cotton. He couldn't have silk and satin. He couldn't, he couldn't mix any of the elements. He always had to wear the same material from inside to outside, from top to bottom, made the Jews look different in their physical appearance by their clothing. You could always tell a Jew by his clothing. 
But verse number 30 says those thieves, they not only took his money, they stripped him of his clothing. You say, well, what kind of perverts were they? Well, you have to remember we're living in a society that's so blessed, we don't even remember how blessed we are. There's some people, they don't have two sets of clothing. They don't even have a pair of shoes to wear. And some people can get so poor that they might not just take your money, they might think your wardrobe's pretty nice too. They might actually kill you just for a pair of shoes that you got on. And so this man had been robbed literally of everything. He's probably laying out in the street with nothing on but maybe a loincloth. And, and these Jewish leaders are coming by and they're looking at him and they say to themselves, you know, I'd help him if I knew he was a Jew. But I don't know what nationality he is. And so they'd rather let that man sit in the road and suffer, maybe let that man sit in the road and die, is to help somebody that wouldn't be of their same nationality. You say, well, preacher, surely religious people aren't that bad off, but I'm here to tell you, some people are pretty bad who don the apparel of religion. But I'm not here to throw stones at them. I'm here to ask me a question. Are you one of them? The parable is describing who my neighbor is. Uh, there's the man who needs the help. I got to tell you, I'm the blessed man. I, I, I'm not one who really needs help. But am I the person, the religious person, who would walk around a needy person and, instead of offering to help a needy person? Well, there's three groups of people in this parable. First one is the needy person. The second one is the religious people. And then there's the third one. The Bible calls him the Samaritan. The Samaritan represents everybody else. We've talked about those who need help. We've talked about the religious people who ought to love God and be wanting to help. The Samaritan represents everybody else. Uh, people who are saved, people who are lost, doesn't matter, represents everybody else. Would represent uh, doctors and nurses. Would represent first responders. Would represent uh, good people like maybe uh, these Catholics who have all these hospitals that start with a saint something or other. St. Jude or, or St. Vincent's Catholic hospitals. It, it would represent Shriners who, who always seem to be standing on the street corners trying to collect money. And, and you hear of them taking kids and other people at no cost to hospitals to make sure that they get medical care. Uh, it would be, it would be uh, anybody, everybody who, who is interested in, in those that are poor or those that are hungry or those that are naked or those that are old or, or those that are hurting. All of these people all lumped in together. That's what the Samaritan represents. Unfortunately, the Samaritan represents what a lot of the religious people preach against. A lot of the religious people preach against people like the Samaritans. The Samaritan in this story was despised by the religious people. Samaria was that land that used to be North Israel. But back around 722, that, that those tribes of Israel had gotten so sinful that God brought the Assyrians in and literally defeated those, those, those ten tribes. And not just defeated them, but took them out of the land. The only ones that were left in the land were the Jews that were too poor and too worthless for the enemy army to want to take. And then they brought other nations into that land and gave it to them. And those few Jews that were left began to intermingle and, and to marry with them. And, and then all of a sudden, now you've got a new, a new race of people a new nation of people, an international group of people, and the Jews despised them. They despised them so much they wouldn't even walk through their land. They'd go way across the River Jordan and come back up on the far side of the River Jordan just to get around their land so that they wouldn't have to go into that land. Isn't it interesting? Jesus has given us a parable. A parable is supposed to be to teach us who our neighbor is. This lawyer he was a religious person. When we hear the word lawyer, we think about somebody who takes care of legal matters. That's not what the Bible talks about when the Bible talks about a lawyer. A lawyer in the Bible is somebody who studied the Old Testament law. He was a religious person. It would be somebody out of which maybe a scribe might come or out of which a Pharisee might come or out of which some other worthy religious activity might come because he devotes his life to studying the Old Testament law. This was a parable directed to the Christian and it was a parable trying to help the Christian to understand who their neighbor really was. Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? That's the question 
the parable is supposed to answer. Number one, would you notice the three groups? Number two, let's see if we can answer the question. Now, parables are interesting. Parables are always earthly stories with heavenly meaning. More times than not, more times than not with a parable, you got to do some digging. There's, there's some element of mystery or something that's hidden that you have to uncover. A lot of times when we talk about parables, just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the parable of the wheat and the tares. Spent a lot of time making sure that we understood what the elements of the parable were, because you can't really understand the parable unless you understand the elements. And then we come to the to that truth, that main truth that's usually just tucked away right out of sight, but it's there if you're willing to dig for it just a little bit. That's the way most parables are. As you read this parable, just the parable itself, you never actually see the answer to the question. Well, what's the question? The lawyer asks it. Well, then who is my neighbor? Uh, who is it that I'm supposed to love like I love myself? He wasn't willing to accept the fact that all of us just need to love everybody. So he wanted to narrow his field. So who, who do you think my neighbor is? And now Jesus gives the parable. Nowhere in the parable does Jesus actually say who our neighbor is. But when the parable is all done in verse number 36 and 37, he asked the lawyer, now, which one of these three do you think was doing the neighborly thing? And the lawyer actually answers the question. And Jesus tells him he's got the right answer. And some of you are already there reading it, so you already know what the answer is. But let's don't do that. For a few moments, let's see if the answer wasn't given by the lawyer, who do we think our neighbor would be? Who do we think? Our, talking to Christians, it's a Christian message. It was directed to this lawyer. He's supposed to be a Christian. It's to help us Christians to understand who our neighbors. So who might we think our neighbors are? Might we, by looking at this parable, think our neighbor is the fellow who looks like we look? Same skin color, same kind of hairstyles. Could we possibly read this parable and come to the conclusion that that the parable is teaching us that our neighbor is the person that looks like us? The answer is, I don't think so. I don't think so. That doesn't seem to play into this parable at all. Well, what about the person who worships like us? Maybe this parable is teaching us that the neighbor that we need to be open-hearted towards, the one that we need to be prepared to help, that's the person who worships like we worship. But then again, I'm looking at this, this parable, and I've got this man, this Samaritan, called the Good Samaritan by most of us nowadays, that this Samaritan probably didn't know anything about this guy's religion. He didn't know anything about his nationality. He couldn't know whether he was a Jew or a Gentile. He couldn't know whether he was a Samaritan like himself or whether he was a Jew. Matter of fact, the Bible never even tells us anything more about this man. He couldn't have known what kind of worship this man rendered, whether he was a worshiper of God at all. He could not tell, not by the parable alone. Could it be somebody who looks like me? Well, not according to the parable. Could it be somebody who worships like me? Could it be somebody who thinks like me? I mean, uh, maybe they don't look anything like me at all, but, but maybe they think like I think. I mean, after all, there's, there's this knowledge that seems to bond us, these political views, these, these moral views, these, these thoughts about uh, where we are in, in our existence and where we're going. Surely that binds us and makes us into a brotherhood. Uh, those must be the, our neighbor. But the man was probably unconscious. There's no indication that a conversation took place. It doesn't appear as though commonality, neighborhoodness here. It's hinged on people thinking alike. Could it be they have the same values as I have? They think right is what I think right is. They think wrong is what I think wrong is. Again, the man appears to be half dead, if not closer to death than that. Just by looking at the parable, most of the things that you and I, most of the conditions that you and I might pull out of the air and say, I think that's what would make that person a neighbor to me, doesn't appear as though it flies from this parable alone. You say, well, preacher, who do you think? Who do you think our neighbor is? Just by reading the parable, I'd have to say it's anybody that needs help. Anybody that I see that needs help, apparently that person has now become my neighbor. I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not. It kind of burst 
a lot of our classifications. It kind of burst through a lot of our walls. Kind of burst through that racial barrier. I'm an older fella, I guess. I say that a lot because I think I am. But I can't remember a time in my life where I thought our nation was more racially divided than now. Understand, I was a kid in the 60s, wasn't watching the news. I know it was pretty tense in the 60s, but I wasn't watching the news in the 60s. I was only three, okay? So I, but I, in my adult life, I can't think of a time when our nation has ever been more racially divided than it is now. But I'm reading this parable, and I don't see where this fellow ever did figure out what race the other guy was. I, I don't see where he ever did find out what nationality he was. Just looks to me like it really doesn't matter what color a man's skin is, what, what color a woman's skin is. Doesn't, doesn't seem to really matter what, what kind of hair they've got, whether it's straight or curly. Doesn't really seem to matter whether their eyes are oval or somewhat slanted. None of that really seems to play into this particular parable. My neighbor is not based on the racial or the national origins. It seems like it, it, it kind of blows even through our political differences political barriers. I'll be absolutely honest with you. I don't think our nation's been more racially divided. I don't think we've ever had more political upheaval in my adult life than what I'm seeing going on in our world right now. And I'll be honest with you. I've said it. We just had 4th of July last week. I think we've got enemies of our nation sitting in some very high offices. And, and I think it's a terrible situation. But you know what? <laughs> Jesus talked over in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse number 44, that we are to love even our enemies. Hey, even those that would hurt you, even those that would despitefully use you, even those that would persecute you, God gave us Christians. Hey, this isn't a message to the lost folks. This is a message to the saved folks. The message is my neighbor is even my enemy, if any so. Abraham Lincoln made a very wise statement. He made a couple in his lifetime, but one that I heard, he said the best way to eliminate your enemy is to win them. The best way to eliminate your enemy is to win them. The best way to remove an enemy is not to kill them. The best way is to win them to Christ. Who's my neighbor? The truth of this particular parable seems to bust the, rad the racial barriers. It seems to bust the political barriers. It seems to blow through the moral barriers. I know a lot of the people that we see probably have done things, made choices, made decisions that have brought some of their own suffering upon themselves. Even when I talk with Christians who aren't poverty stricken or, or who aren't homeless or, or, or who aren't destitute, I begin to talk with them about marriage problems or problems that they're having with their kids or problems they're having. Or, you know, the amazing thing is more times than not, you can find out they were instrumental in causing some of their own problems. Truth of the matter is most of the time we have brought our problems on us. And many of the people who are in this world are having a hard time. Maybe they did do some things that brought some bad times to them. Maybe the reason they are in need of help now is because of the morals they lived earlier in their life. But you know, this particular parable, this man didn't stop to ask, how many wives have you had? What sexual orientation are you? What kind of political views do you have? All he saw was a man that needed help. Who is my neighbor is the question that's asked. And the answer appears to be anyone that needs help. Not a message to the lost folks. It's a message to the saved folks. Because the truth of the matter is we can get so comfortable in our own world where the people that believe like us, the people that act like us, the people that look like us, the people that think like us, we can get so comfortable with that group of people that we forget, hey, it doesn't matter what problems they're having. It doesn't matter how low they are. It doesn't matter how much they've sunk into sin. It doesn't matter how many times we've tried to warn them before. The truth of the matter is, if we can help them, not help them to go further down, not help them to live in the, in the muck and the mire, but if we can help them, then it would appear, according to this parable, that they are our neighbor. And according to this parable, it would appear as though God commands us to help him. Number one, would you notice the three groups of people? Number two, 
would you notice the answer to the question? The question was, then who is my neighbor? Number three, would you notice the command? This parable is different for several reasons. It's, it's different because in verses 36 and 37, Jesus actually revealed or allowed the man, the lawyer, to reveal the hidden message. Well, the hidden message was the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? The man said, uh, the one who did the good deeds. He's being neighborly to the one who needed the help. And, and, and so the, the, the hidden message is brought forth. But it's also different because it ends with a command. Most parables don't end with a command. It's different because Jesus allowed the lawyer to reveal the hidden message, but it's different also because it ends in a command. It's a simple command. Verse number 37, go thou and do likewise. Go thou and do likewise. So for some reason, it's a simple command, but, but Christians kind of stumble over this. It, it's, it's only made up of three components. Number one, go. That's a hard word to misunderstand. That means don't just sit inside your church and wait for somebody who has a need to come to you. You're to get up and you're to go help them. As if we're being commanded to leave the walls of this church and to go out into our communities and to help people that need help, to look for people that need help. I think one of the big problems we as Christians have is we're really glad to help people. We'll, we'll tell a lost person how to get saved. We'll, we'll help somebody who's hungry. This church, very generous. We'll put, put clothes on your back. We'll put gas in your tank. Uh, we'll, we'll pay your power bill. Never seen a church any more generous than this. But most everything that we do, we're waiting for somebody to come to us. God never did tell the church, have them come. He always told the church, you go. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about helping or preaching the gospel or, or, or anything else. The command is always go, 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 go take the gospel. Go do thou likewise. It's not an issue of whether we should sit here and wait. The command is quite clear by Jesus. You go and you do what this parable is teaching you to do. The second word in the command is do. Go ye and do, do. He, he's saying, uh, I don't want you to just go and I don't want you to just sit. I want you to go, but I want you to help other people. Green Palm Baptist Church, good church. Preacher, not so much. Good church. One of the problems that we have, I believe, honestly, is we're just too isolated. I think it's good for us to be isolated in some areas. I think it's good. The Bible does teach separation. But a church that's isolated from its neighborhood, from its community, is a church that's not needed. If this church were to be swallowed by a sinkhole and be gone tomorrow morning, would anybody in the community even miss it? That's a question that I ask myself as the pastor of this church quite often. And if the answer is no, no one would miss it, except maybe the few folks that come to it. But the community itself would just be as well off without it as they are with it. Then, folks, we have failed miserably in the command of Jesus Christ. If all we are is a spokesman, even a, a, a lighthouse for the gospel, if that's all we are, so that they would just as soon see us go as to stay, then we have failed miserably. Somehow we're to interact with this community in such a way that they would miss our presence, not just our message, but they would miss our presence if we weren't here. That's what the command is. Go, go and do. Do what? Help your neighbors. That's the command. And then the third word of the command is likewise. You take what this parable is given to you and you do the same thing. You watch for opportunities to help. You help when you see the opportunities. This is the Christian's message. This is what Jesus was trying to help this lawyer, this student of the Word of God, this man who probably knew more about the Bible than, than probably nine out of ten people in the nation of Israel did. And yet for all of his knowledge, his own answer convicted his heart. 
So who then is my neighbor? Because I sure know I haven't treated everybody like I would like for everybody to treat me. The whole parable is to give the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Who is the neighbor of the green palm? Just the guy that lives next door to me? I don't think so. Just the guy that looks like me? I don't think so. The guy who thinks like me, the guy who worships like me? No, no, no. It's anybody who needs help. Even if they've brought some of their own problems upon themselves. Even if they are addicted. Even if they have lived in immorality. Even if they are engaging in activities that we would find repulsive. The truth of the matter is... We're the church. We are the body of Jesus Christ. We are Christ's hands, arms, feet, legs. We're the only body that he's got to help the sick, to help the hungry, to help the sinful, to realize Jesus loves them. It's the call of God to the church. Would you bow your head please and close your eyes? As I try to find the message that God wants me to preach, I often look at many Bible passages and to be quite honest, often look at many outlines. And I keep looking till I feel the Spirit of God says that's the one I want you to preach. This is really another one of those messages that I would not normally preach on a Sunday morning. It's one of those messages I'd be more likely to preach on a Sunday night. For some reason, I felt like God wanted me to preach this message this morning, which must mean, if I've not missed the boat altogether, that God wants me to preach this message to this group of people, to this group of people, not those that aren't here, but to this group of people. You are Christians. You are believers in Jesus Christ. You're good people. But are we treating others like our neighbors? In a vile world, it's often easy to get angry and frustrated. It's often easy to get to the place where you're going to treat them like they've treated you. As a matter of fact, people describe that syndrome quite often. That's not the body of Jesus Christ. That's not the Christian message. I don't know who God might be speaking to this morning, but if it's you, I pray God will speak to your heart clearly, loudly, plainly. And perhaps today you'll let go of some anger, and perhaps today you'll let go of some bitterness, and perhaps today you'll let go of some inactivity, and that God will use you to do something to make this church important to the world around us. Father, would you accomplish your will? Would you accomplish your work this morning? We'll do our best to do what you tell us to do, for we ask it all in Jesus' name.